In 2022, all nine members of TWICE renewed their contract with JYP Entertainment and all 13 members of Seventeen renewed their contract with Playdis Entertainment. This means we get to see more of these two iconic groups release new songs, perform, and stay together. This brings up a question, what is a K-pop contract? Welcome to K-pop Basic Lessons, where I break down foundational topics about K-pop as a bilingual and bicultural Korean American who loved K-pop since the 90s. Today, we'll talk about what a K-pop contract entails, its length, renewal process, and how K-pop companies make money. What is a K-pop contract? A contract is an agreement between the entertainment company and the artist, outlining the length of their working relationship, how they'll split the money generated by the artist's work, intellectual property and licensing rights, the scope of their schedules and promotional activities, and compensation for damages, etc. It usually has an exclusivity clause, preventing the artist from signing with multiple companies at the same time. It also outlines penalties for terminating the contract earlier than the proposed date. Once it's signed, the document is legally binding. How long is a typical contract? There's a law that passed in 2009 that limits the maximum length of a contract between an artist and an entertainment company to seven years. That's why you see most groups either leaving their companies or going their separate ways after seven years. What happens after the contract is over? There are three main paths artists choose when their contract expires. First, they renew their contract with the same company. Usually the terms change to be more favorable to the artist or the more popular members can negotiate a special deal. Second option is to continue their career by signing with another company, freelancing, or starting your own company. The third option is to retire or take a break from the industry without signing on to another company. How did the term slave contract come about? K-pop contracts were criticized for unfair, ridiculous, and inhumane conditions, thus coining the term slave contract or doya gea. Common practices included long contract terms, sometimes up to 10 or 13 years. No compensation to the artist until they surpass 500,000 plus album sales. And very high penalty fees if they terminate the contract early, essentially making it impossible to leave. The first generation of K-pop idols have spoken up about the unfair terms before, but the most famous event that brought the end to the slave contract was when three members of Dongbang filed a lawsuit against SM Entertainment in 2009. Side note, Dongbang in 2009 was a legend. They were at the peak of their career. Their popularity shot through the roof, not only in Korea, but all of Asia as the most successful K-pop group in history so far. So for three out of five members to file a lawsuit against the most iconic K-pop entertainment company and to leave the group was a big deal. Anyways, in 2009, after the lawsuit, the Korean Fair Trade Commission, Kungjong Goreweone, issued a new set of standards for contracts between artists and the entertainment companies. The most prominent features of these new standards are the contract length cannot exceed seven years. The entertainment companies cannot overly surveillance personal lives of artists, and the fee for ending the contract early was reduced. This poses a tangential question. So how do K-pop idols make money? There are four main ways K-pop companies make money. First is album sales. When you release an album, you make money through streaming, physical album sales, although very few people listen to music on CDs these days, but fans buy them as souvenirs and collectibles. And every time your music is played on TV, TikTok, radio, and other offline events. Second is performances and events. This includes concerts and fan meetings where attendees pay a fee to see the artist in person. Third is ads and television appearances. This includes appearing on variety shows and promoting fashion items, food, electronics, etc. through brand deals. Last and growing category of revenue is licensing. This includes merchandise, so shirts, hats, stickers, keychains, content, ad revenue from YouTube videos, and paid membership dues from Weverse, VLive, and Listen. Royalties also include cacao emojis and line characters. So why should we care about this? Blackpink, NCT, Astro, SF9, Ujusonya, Momoland, and Pentagon. These K-pop groups' contracts will expire in 2023, and we can be on the lookout to see what happens next. And K-pop is a profit-driven business. To be aware of how they make money and how idols work with their entertainment companies helps us see how we, as fans, fit into the profit-making equation. Thanks for tuning in! My name is K-pop Sociology, promoting the critical consumption of K-pop. Please like, subscribe, and comment with any questions or new topic suggestions.